Aloha, I'm Lila Berg, and we are here at the Honolulu Zoo, ready to meet the people who inform, inspire, and impact our daily lives. Thank you for joining us on Island Focus. So this looks like a fairly new facility. Yes, this is our new ectotherm complex. We ectotherm. Ectotherm. That is an animal that requires the environment to regulate its body temperature, rather than regulating it internally the way we mammals do. So snails and skinks and reptiles. Tortoises. Tortoises, <laughs> yeah. And, and you're holding something very special here. I know we're passing, looks like a laboratory. Yes, this is our invertebrate laboratory. And we've set up an invertebrate program in conjunction with DLNR, the Department of Land and Natural Resources. So they have been working to breed native butterflies, native snails, and a couple of other insect species. And we're working with them currently on one species of snail and the Kamehameha butterfly. Which is what you have in your hand, almost. Almost. <laughs> They're what getting is it that you have here? We have a late stage caterpillar. And so these take about two weeks and then they'll hatch into butterflies. So we harvest butterfly eggs from the exhibit and we raise them through the caterpillar stage in the invertebrate lab. Then we turn them loose as full grown adult butterflies in our exhibit here. And the Kamehameha butterfly is our state insect and it is found only here in Hawaii, nowhere else in the world. Fabulous, well it's wonderful work you're doing. Thank you so much. Mahalo for tuning in to Island Focus and joining me in meeting Linda Santos, director of the Honolulu Zoo. Glad you could be with us. And thank you so much for taking the time from a busy morning here at the zoo. <laughs> thank you for having me. Please share with the audience, you know, uh, as the director, you wouldn't have this job if it wasn't very special for you. Yeah. How do you spend your day if not in the office? I like to spend my day, you know, walking around the zoo grounds and looking at uh, the landscaping and the different animals. And so a lot of times at the very end of the day, I will get on the cart and drive around or take a walk and stroll through the <laughs> zoo and just check everything out, you know. It's changed a lot since I grew up. The zoo is very different from when I was a child coming here. Um, the enclosures and how we maintain animals is very different. Um, we're trying to get away from your typical square cages, cages and, um, and making the habitats more naturalistic um, and it you know for happier animals. Did you always love animals growing up? I did. I sort of had a little menagerie of different pets. No monkeys. <laughs> no monkeys. <laughs> you know your normal cats, dogs, turtles, fish, um, you know different things and I've always been interested in learning all about different things about different animals. If people would want to come here, uh, I would imagine being part of the city and county, there's a Kama Aina rate. Mm -hmm. But what will we find as we enter the gates? So I think if you're coming from Waikiki and you first enter the zoo, the first thing you see is um, we have two animal exhibits up front, the waterfowl pond and then the flamingos. But as you enter to this area of the zoo, it's a huge green space. And the first half of the zoo is mainly birds because that's what this was originally. It was a bird park and then it transitioned into a zoo. So there's a lot of lawn space for picnicking, um, kids to run around and exercise, and then you just get to stroll and see the different animals. So it's, it's a really beautiful space just to have some peace and quiet or families to come and enjoy. And to think and to walk yeah. and just to hear birds too, you yeah. know, and monkey screaming, we heard that this morning. Yes. <laughs> um, you had one message to the public. Um, I know you're very grateful that the public has supported 
the yes. city council and your budgeting, but what would that message be? Hawaii, of course, is the endangered species capital of the world. So we'd like to try and help out. So our horticulturist does the Manoa Cliff Trails huh. and he um, helps with the restoration um, to restore it with native plants. And so that's a community project. Uh, we get volunteers, our concessionaire, everybody participates. And we're also in the new ectotherm complex, have the ability to uh, partner with Department of Land and Natural Resources. And so our staff there is working on the pulelehua, which is the Kamehameha butterfly. Um, so they reproduce them to mm -hmm. release back into the wild. And we're also now taking on the Oahu snail which um, it was uh, very limited. So we're rearing those to release back into the wild as well. We might pause at that moment. I don't want the snails in my yard. Yes. <laughs> um, we look forward to uh, looking a little bit further into the zoo and, and what you have to offer. And I want to thank you for the time you've spent with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've been listening to Linda Santos, who is director of the Honolulu Zoo. Mahalo for joining us. here at the Honolulu Zoo conversing with Jonathan Ho with the Plant Quarantine Branch of the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. Glad you could join us. And thank you also for taking time from your busy day. Thank you for having me. Coming in uniform, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this place, this zoo is also part of, connected with your Plant Quarantine Branch. Oh yes, yeah. So um, all basically all the animals here at the zoo are under permit. Um, we regulate not only plants is in our name, but we also do non-domestic animals as well, such lions, tigers, bears, elephants, snakes, all the, yeah, all the stuff here is basically under permit from our office. Permit, license, inspection, that's mm -hmm. the kinds of things that, uh, services that your office provides? Yes, yeah, so we do import inspection for the things that we regulate, so um, non-domestic animals, plants, microorganisms, we also do export services, so people that want to ship their lays to the mainland, for example, we do that, ex we do that inspection as well. So some of us who grew up here in Hawaii d often don't think about what could come in mm -hmm. that would hurt us uh, and affect our ecosystem, mm -hmm or what we could transport out. Mm -hmm. um, how does your department inform us and, and how do you take care of that? You know, so what we try to do for inspect, um, for education at least, is try to be out there as much as possible. And, you know, we work a lot of times with partners such as the Honolulu Zoo for, you know, getting that message out. Like they have a display inside of their, their new reptile enclosure that talks a lot about like the pest hotline. It talks about what people can do to help prevent the spread and entry of invasive species, such as like rapid ohia death or snakes or, you know, whatever crazy thing is out there. In okay, the so animals are a little bit more obvious to yes. us. But in terms of plants, mm -hmm. so for instance, I brought a red tea leaf mm -hmm. plant from Kona to mm -hmm. my house in East Oahu. They let me through. The regulations for inner island movement are a little bit different from importation um, in that cut flowers and foliage don't require an inspection every time. They're subject to random inspection. But if you were to bring that in from the mainland, mm. it would be subject to inspection and inspe you would have to present it to an inspector to make sure there's no diseases or insects or any other crazy things on it before it's allowed entry into the state. So what experiences have you had, besides the snakes and the reptiles, mm -hmm. with uh, invasive species, let's say plants or viruses? The most um, uh, well-known one at the moment now is rapid ohia death. It is a disease that's killing ohia throughout the Hawaii island, and really no one knows how it got here. It's transferred um, through boring insects, like beetles that kind of basically, that sawdust blows out into the environment, and also through um, human activity, through um, um, cutting of infected trees, um, damaging uh, roots when you're walking. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to transfer it and um, it's just really bad on Hawaii Island. So as our conversation draws to a close for today, what might the public do to support your efforts in the department? If they, Besides not bringing something in. You well, know? <laughs> no, we, we want people to bring things in, uh, but what it boils down to is present it for inspection. Let the inspectors do their jobs because the reality is most people have clean stuff, but it's for that you know small percentage that don't, we want to make sure that we can get it before it gets introduced into the environment. And the reality is most people will do the right thing and, and we, we um, want to support them. So what I hear you saying is not just government's job. 
well, to monitor yeah. and to make sure we're safe. Oh yes, it takes everybody to, to do the right thing. Well, you've obviously found the right position for yourself. Thank you. <laughs> I know you started with bugs, right, or something? Yes, yes, I started with insects and now I'm doing um, all other things, microorganisms, <laughs> plants, yeah. Well, who would have thought, right, that an interest in a cockroach yeah. or a fly yeah. would yeah. lead you to be one of our leaders here in Hawaii, so. Never would have imagined it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. You shared a conversation with me and Jonathan Ho, who is with the Plant Quarantine Branch of the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. Mahalo for joining us. Today on Island Focus, you will enjoy meeting Laura Beeman, who is the coach of the University of Hawaii women's basketball team. Thank you for joining us. And I appreciate you taking the time as well. Thank you for having me on today. What a cool job you have. I love it. Um, you know, <laughs> it gives me an opportunity to stay active. It gives me an opportunity to do something that I enjoyed as a high school and a college athlete. Um, and now I get to be a part of some really wonderful young ladies, their lives. Uh, hopefully influence them in a great way, hopefully win some games, um, and just create great memories. Well, I think it's just wonderful that there is a woman who is <laughs> a women's basketball coach, number one, but also that you're at such an influential time in young women's lives. You know, I, I never realized the importance and the impact that a coach can have on whether it's a young man or a young woman. And I think that it's a responsibility that you have to really be ready for. Um, I started coaching when I was very young, probably 21, 22. Oh my. Yeah, I did things very differently as a 22 <laughs> year old coach as I do today. We won't mention the age, but as I do today. Um, and I think today it's more about the significance that I can have on these young ladies' lives than the success that we can have. I think there's a combination of significance and success. You can still win and have a great impact on their lives, but uh, my maturation as a coach and, and realizing um, just what we can do together as women. Uh, the, the influence, like I said, that I can have on their lives and, and not telling them what to do, but trying to give them the tools and just some experience so they can make their own great decisions. Because that's what we want is young, strong, empowered, responsible women to go kind of forge their own way in their lives. And so I think, uh, like you said, uh, you know, at the beginning, a woman coaching women is really important for these young ladies to have a role model. Um, to say, hey, look, you can do it too. I wasn't a great basketball player. Um, I don't know if I'm a great coach, but hopefully I'm in a position where I can say, be you and be proud of who you are and go make your own experiences and go, go just have a wonderful life and take these four years and enjoy them and make relationships that you're never gonna have again. Um, so I feel very fortunate what I do. Well, and what I appreciate in, in your words is that you're developing or helping to support the development of young women as themselves, but also as a team. You know, categorically, many of us grew up in the female world <laughs> um, in competition with mm -hmm. other women rather than really having women as our best friends and our confidants. I think coaching women is um, challenging. Uh, and I say that, I am a woman, I can say that. <laughs> you know, you, you coach guys and they have an issue and they can just say, hey, let's go outside and take care of it. And then they come back and it's like water under the bridge. And I know women who are like, oh, I don't like her. And I'm like, why? I don't know, but in kindergarten, she did something to me. And I'm like, wait a second, wait a second. You know? And yesterday and, she looked at me. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so the, to teach young people in general, one, how to cope, um, and one, how to play well with each other, I think is so important, not only on the basketball court, but for life. You know, you're gonna be in a job and you're not going to be able to work in this vacuum. You're going to have to have relationships with other people. And so to, to kind of create an environment in our locker room where conflict is good, um, healthy conflict is better, and not making it personal, um, understanding that you don't have to be right and you can still reach a common goal, I think is, is really important in today's youth. And there is a next moment and tomorrow. Yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> that would be shocking to some of my players. Like, God, I love them, I love them. But yeah, they're in the moment. And so when something happens, it's all about that moment versus, okay, wait, you're right. There's a tomorrow, there's a future, we're going to be okay. If someone just looked at you funny, it doesn't mean that they you know, hate you for life. Well, and as we wrap up this very brief conversation, one um, memory or your most outstanding first experience as a coach that 
shifted the way you look at your job? That's an easy one. I um, mean, it was actually relatively young in my coaching career, probably my third or fourth year when I was at Mount San Antonio College. I had a young lady who, um, she had a rough life, you know, and, and she was the first person in her family to go to college. Um, e excellent basketball player, and basketball was the only thing that she wanted to do in her life. And she was arrested for stealing. Hmm. And I was her first phone call. And she said, coach, I made a bad choice and I am in jail and what are we gonna do? And uh, I said, how long are you gonna be in jail? She goes, probably 30 days. And I said, well, we're in a part of the academic year where you don't have to you know, drop out of classes. Let me call my dean and see if we can make this work. You're a good kid, you made a bad choice. And you went to bat for her? Absolutely. She got out of jail and? We won a state championship. And so to watch <laughs> that young lady rolling yeah, around on the floor, celebrating a championship after that was, uh, it changed my life as You're a coach. You're the best. You're the best. Appreciate thank you it. for a few moments together. Thank you. And thank you too for joining into Island Focus. We've had the wonderful opportunity to speak with Coach Laura Beeman of the University of Hawaii women's basketball team. Mahalo. We here. We're in the Honolulu Zoo's Keiki Zoo. <laughs> I see the children in with the goats. Yes. <laughs> so the goats an interactive portion of the Keiki Zoo where children can go in and pet the goats. And here we have chickens and a horse and Lonnie Moo. Lonnie Moo. Moo. <laughs> the famous Lonnie Moo from Metagold. Um, Metagold's one of our partners. Um, but the Keiki Zoo in the past used to have just really domesticated common animals, sheep, goats, the cow was always a part of it. And it's evolved where we have um, a lot of different animals to um, educate the children with and they can get up close when a keeper brings them out for an encounter. So it's really exciting. I, I like the idea that you also have a space for children yes. to experience animals and not be afraid of them. Yes. You know, and since it's evolved from domesticated animals to now even some exotic, we have some reptiles and we have a coconut crab named Krapita. <laughs> <laughs> and everything has names, of course. Everything has so names. So the children can remember. <laughs> yes. Well, this is a very cool place. Thank you so much for taking the You're time welcome. again. And I'm so happy to see that Lonnie was still alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here at the Honolulu Zoo with Mo Radke, who's the president of the Friends of the Natatorium. Happy you could be with us today. And very happy to meet you. Very happy to meet you, and thanks for having the opportunity for me to be here today. Well, it's our pleasure to learn a little bit more about the Natatorium. You know, growing up in Waikiki, as I have, the Natatorium was always a fixture. It's a, a failing fixture at the moment, mm -hmm. an ailing fixture. Uh, what is your role as president? And tell us a little bit more about the Natatorium. Well, my role of, as president is to make sure that the uh, history of the Natatorium and the reason for why it's here is uh, communicated to the public. Uh, before the Friends of the Natatorium even existed, there was never a need for that because the Natatorium was such a community gathering place, such a place of life that many people from Hawaii and uh, other other islands and even from the mainland knew about the natatorium. You think of golf and St. Andrews as the home of golf. The natatorium was basically the St. Andrews of swimming in, here in Hawaii and for the nation. Right, that's how I remember it, but there's more significance to the natatorium. Absolutely. The reason the natatorium is here is because of the uh, trauma of World War I. And when those folks came back, and there was 10,000 folks from Hawaii that served, when the folks came back, they needed a monument to recognize that service. And instead of having a memorial where people would go to uh, be sad and reflect in that way, they wanted a place where people could come and celebrate life. And the Natatorium, with its swimming and its bleachers, gave folks the opportunity to do that. The Natatorium for you personally, and career-wise, is also significant. Absolutely. Uh, I, I spent 30 years in the Navy. And as a veteran, uh, it's important to me and I think it's important to most citizens that whatever was done for them by the folks in the, in the military is honored appropriately. 
And this memorial and other more memorials, well, actually, there's no memorials like the natatorium. Mm -hmm. It's unique. It's one of a kind. But there are other World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, uh, Iraq, Iran War memorials that uh, are supposed to remind us today of the sacrifice and service of those that came before us and some of those that actually gave their full measure of devotion. And uh, when we think of that, even though the natatorium represents a war of 100 years ago, the importance of that is imbued in somebody who's serving today, who might only be 18 years old. Right. And how we treat their service 100 years ago might reflect on a decision they make to serve today. So with such significance, and such importance, not only in history, but present time. The Natatorium is also under siege, <laughs> if I may use that word, sure. um, of being demolished, of being not just ignored, but being completely destroyed. What, what efforts are you making now as a nonprofit? Well, uh, our efforts is basically to educate, uh, to try and bring the entities together that actually are responsible for the natatorium. So it's under city and county? The, yes. The, presently, it's under the city and county of Honolulu. It was uh, previously a state entity and uh, via a uh, uh, order from the uh, governor, it was transferred to the city and county of Honolulu to operate. And so is it in their budget or is there are there plans to save it, preserve it? Uh, this is probably a good time to talk about the environmental impact study that's presently ongoing. We're at the final EIS stage and we're waiting from the draft to the final portion. The draft EIS asked for preservation as the preferred alternative, which was very exciting to us and gave us a lot of hope that the opportunity to move forward and open to the public is still there. Uh, when the final EIS comes out, There'll be a comment period and will be the opportunity for everybody to have a chance to weigh in on what that uh, might look like. So we'll put the information on your website and how to contact you and the Friends of the Natatorium so that people can give their support. When that final EIS <laughs> comes out again, Olelo for sure will see me again and so will Thank many you. other citizens. Thank you for taking the time with us today. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And mahalo to you, too, for joining in to Island Focus. We've been conversing with Mo Radke, who is the president of the Friends of the Natatorium. Aloha. Join me today in meeting Scarlett Shankles, who is the Director of Education here at the Honolulu Zoo. Glad you could be with us. Thank you. And thank you for taking the time. Definitely, it's my pleasure. You know, Director of Education is a large responsibility and yes. has different meanings, but here at the zoo, it's very specific for you. Definitely, I see education as like my driving force to do what I love, so conservation through education. So we have multiple programs that address that issue and kind of having, changing the perspective of locals and tourists alike here at the zoo. Well, I think we, before the program, we were chatting about the perception of zoos has changed yes, around the world. Yes, definitely. Your job definitely wants to help with that as well. Yes, so I actually started off, um, before I started working here, I was kind of opposed to coming to, to zoos in general. Um, but then I had a job here during the summer and it just completely shifted my perspective and I realized how important zoos are. And within the past 30, 40 years, there's been a transition of how zoos are perceived and their functionality. So it's not entertainment, it's education, us understanding wildlife. And, and what do those programs look like here? Um, so we have zoo camps for Keiki. So we start from a young age and we just range all the way up. So our Keiki have camps that ranges from five, year old, five years old to 11 years old. And we address a lot of different conservation issues. And we just try to, of course, they're young, so it can't be too dark. But we try to give them ways to see the world differently and understand the connection that we have with wildlife. So either here in Hawaii and just internationally in general. So camp is a generic word for uh, workshops or... Oh, do they actually like, spend the night here? They don't spend the night here, so we're here <laughs> throughout the day from 8 a.m. to 2.30 oh, okay. p.m. Um, and it is lesson driven. So we try to address national science curriculum, age appropriate, of course, so they're separated into different ages. 
And they're here just exploring the zoo, exploring the concepts that we want them to understand about different animals that we have here. So you have the camp and any other programs that they could join? We have our twilight tours, which is, I think, one of my favorite times to be here at the zoo. Mm -hmm. So it's an evening tour at 5.30 p.m. It just depends on the season. Um, but you get to be here when no one's here, and it's cool. Uh, you're not sweating and dehydrated in the heat. <laughs> and the animals are still away. The animals, well, some of them during the day, people, can, they don't see a lot of animals mm. because it's hot and they're covered in hair and they're crepuscular, which is a natural sleeping cycle where they're up during twilight hours. So when you actually get here, the animals are waking up, they're becoming more active. You get to see them doing behaviors that you would never catch at noon or at 1 p.m. And I know from our previous conversation that it's important for you to have local people understand local children is particularly, understand how wildlife plays into their world. Yes. So even though we don't have giraffes naturally. Even there. though we don't naturally <laughs> have giraffes, I think having all of these animals as ambassadors for their species opens up this opportunity for kids to even teach adults, like why is this animal here? Why are they important in their ecosystem? So obviously we have a cycle of life, right? And we try to teach the kids what that means. Hmm. So taking an animal out of an ecosystem does detrimental effects on other aspects of that ecosystem. So we want kids to take that away, teach their parents when they're like, it's just a giraffe. You're like, no, it's bigger than that. Like there's <laughs> literally and figuratively, it's bigger. So if you had a message for families as we conclude our conversation, what would that be? I think as humans, we can be critical thinkers. We have the capability of just, we have such a complex brain. So tap into that and understand our connection with the wildlife and how we can positively affect it. We do address kind of like the human's effect on the habitat and species, but I think looking at some, how can we change it? What can we do to help? It's kind of the message. We well, and I really appreciate your perspective, you know, the, of understanding the, not just the ecosystem of a region, but of the planet and our role in it. Yes, the balance there has to be pretty big. We have to think about it. Well, thank you so much for your time and thank for doing you. the exciting work that I think you love. <laughs> I love it, definitely. <laughs> thank <laughs> thank you. you so much, Lila. Thank you. Mahalo to you for tuning in to Island Focus and my conversation with Scarlett Shankles, who is the Director of Education here at the Honolulu Zoo. Thank you. Mahalo to the Honolulu Zoo for hosting us today and to you for tuning in to Island Focus. I'm Lila Berg. Aloha and malama pono. Take care of each other. See you soon. <laughs>